This is a big episode. It's another duo episode. So uh, you wanted the best. Well, they couldn't fucking make it. So here's what you get. From New Zealand, Iron Culture, the podcast. But we're talking today about moderation, uh, vegetarian diets, trying to pursue a lifelong journey of lifting. We will get into this discussion before we do. I don't know how this keeps happening to us. But Eric, we got to address some controversy, man. We, we There's no way we could begin this podcast without first addressing the elephant in the room. Yeah, I mean, this is something that's on our, it's on everyone's mind. Uh, right. It's it's serious. It's uh, it's the topic of our times. And, um, you know, if you've been paying attention to the media, whether mm-hmm. that's uh, the mass media, um, the, the, the fake news that's out there, or sure. uh, just, just the rumblings on the street. If you've got your ear to the street, if you're on the internet, or if you're watching TV in any country, on any channel, at any time, yeah. we, we know this is what you're thinking about. So take it away. So, yeah, I... I think I should brief everyone before we read the official statement as to what transpired several episodes ago. I'll do my best to recount it, and I don't want to say anything slanderous, Eric. Um, Omar, may, may, may I? Yeah, please, please. I, I think it's okay. just important people understand that um, Iron Culture, we see ourselves as leaders. Um, and we're going to do – leadership is about making hard decisions. Uh, and you know there were there were previously people associated with Iron Culture who just no longer can be because they didn't represent Iron Culture, um, and that's that's not a decision we were happy to make, but it was a decision that we would make again if we had to. Yeah. And um, I, I I know that we have a bright future ahead of us because of that, and I think that's just the preface that I wanted to 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 kind of get people in the right mindset to understand. Uh, the yeah. decisions that, that we've made at Iron Culture. So go, go ahead from there, Omar. Yeah, uh, so we received this letter, and I was told by our producers that we can't go on air unless I read it. So I'm just going to go ahead and read this statement to the people. Um, it says, press release for immediate distribution by Iron Culture podcast. And it says, it is our confident but unfortunate duty to announce that Omar Isoff and Eric Helms, sole co-founders of Iron Culture, have been dismissed as the co-hosts of Iron Culture. This decision is the only appropriate response due to their insensitive, inaccurate, and while not legally definable slander, slanderous comments in reference to Danny Lennon being a serial killer. Moving forward, Iron Culture will no longer be hosted in a traditional sense by shock jocks willing to sacrifice intellectual rigor and compassion for ratings and controversy. Instead, we will henceforth be internally guided by the original creators of Iron Culture to ensure the sanctity of our message. In essence, in this time of strife and division, we've decided to be the change by now leading from the heart. Thus, we would like to proudly announce instead of having hosts, the original co-founders themselves... Eric Helms and Omar Isoff will now be speaking on behalf of Iron Culture for each episode. We hope this bold but warranted action serves as an example to other podcasts and finally to show that we stand behind our words with action. We would like to publicly welcome Danny Lennon of Signal Nutrition Radio to the new Iron Culture podcast, now led solely by the original co-founders. <sighs> That's a bombshell, my friend. I think you 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 did that really well, and I think uh, Danny Lennon of Signal Nutrition Radio, yeah. which is uh, you know been been around the block a long time, yeah. and uh, I think he's going to not only appreciate that because yeah. um, I know if someone said, "Hey, Eric, you're not a serial killer," I would I'd appreciate that, yeah. um, and offer to have him back on because I mean there is no higher honor, and uh, the reason why no there's no higher honor than being on Iron Culture right. is because certain people don't make the cut and that was our old co-hosts <laughs> right uh I, i'm not even going to state their names um but i'm very very happy to now say that unlike most podcasts the co-founders not figureheads you know that this isn't this isn't a situation where you have uh you know a figurehead monarch uh lead, leading a country uh we are directly led by the heart of what we are by the people you know yeah. we're, we're like a direct democracy where we've elected ourselves yeah. Uh, by voting for ourselves with the two votes that are available, 100% turnout, yeah. uh, and we selected us. And I think w- who better to lead a podcast than the co-founders uh, versus all these other podcasts out there that just have these 
these hosts, which, man, uh, to, to all the other co-founders or founders of podcasts out there, you just need to be, be, be really attentive to what these representatives uh, you know, are doing and saying on your behalf. Right. And if you really want to st- or be, be a man, woman, or otherwise of your own conviction and stand by your beliefs, why don't you step behind the microphone? Um, I can, I'll speak personally, but I'll also let you talk about this, Omar. I, yeah. I am, I'm intimidated, and I think I should be, but I'm also willing and able to meet the challenge of being yeah. a representative of myself of Iron Culture. Uh, and I'm actually really pleased that we let go of our previous co-hosts. <sighs> We are trying to be the change we want to see in the world. And this, folks, is democracy right now in front of you. People will claim all the time that democracy is over. Where has it gone? Voter turnout's at an all-time low. But the two co-founders decided to step up. And instead of playing a backseat and relegating to these co-hosts that, as you said, Eric, are shock jocks, okay? They're there for the Mm -hmm. tension. They're there for the controversy. Uh... We have always appreciated Signal Radio with Danny. Um, you know, I can't say I've listened to any episode, but I can say the fact mm. that he's been doing it that long is just that impressive. And well, we as co-founders can neither confirm nor deny that he's a serial killer because no one knows, right? No one, no one can know. Right. Only you can answer that question. We feel fairly confident moving forward, inviting him over. And I guess maybe the last question I'd want to ask you, would you now be comfortable with him staying at your house? I know that's a tough question and we don't have to answer it publicly, but. I, I don't, I don't, I almost don't feel like that is the question, Omar. <laughs> right. You know, the, the question is, um, do we have the right to, to, to judge others for actions that we can't prove? Right. Um, in general, I would say no, you okay. know, and uh, so so it almost doesn't matter whether or not he'll be at my house for this next episode. The first time he was, <laughs> this next time it'll probably be over Skype, right? And and that, you know, if if he was a serial killer, which we're not saying, and right. those who did say that have been dismissed uh, appropriately. To be clear, uh, then yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. We we stand by that decision. Um, I would say that, you know, it'd be better him, him being on Skype. And since we don't know that, it doesn't matter. But let's just say he will be on Skype, so it's a non-issue. Right. Um, and I, I think that's that's the way to frame it moving forward. And I just want to say, you know, our co-hosts, they were they were pretty faces, you know. Yeah. I, and um, I'm not proud of it as a company that we selected uh, too attractive, well-spoken. Yeah, hunks, if, if you want to if you wanna use that, that verbiage. Um, you know, it's it's... We, we let Instagram influence us too much. We, yeah. we, we thought that we had to have um, pretty faces, muscular men, attractive voices uh, yeah. with a hint of baritone, um, yeah. you know, long haired gentlemen, cap shoulders, just uh, but without substance is, is beauty anything, you know, beauty uh, without substance internally turns ugly. And I yeah. think we had to let go uh, of those two guests for that reason. We got caught up in the mix. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we let our, our, our integrity come after, uh, the, the big bucks, uh, the, yeah. that we often chase in this podcast game. And, um, I can't tell you, I feel like I've let a gorilla off my shoulders. Uh, I've, I've released a load. I've put down the backpack as John Berardi said, not too long ago of grievances. Yeah. And, um, by the way, I haven't heard John Berardi, uh, recount his statements about Danny Lennon. Um, so, uh, by the way, if you have any lingering anger, hate, or or frustration about those statements, it's completely John Berardi's fault at this stage, yeah. since we've uh, apologized and let go of those people and can no longer be, yeah. uh, you know, found culpable of anything. But moving forward, no backpack of grievances. I feel great. I feel like I'm living my best life. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're standing in integrity. We're we're walking into the shining light with a shining light behind us. There's a lot of shining light, um, and it right. shines so bright. Uh, and I feel good about it because we're we're standing by our convictions, um, and uh, you know we can do no wrong. Is essentially what I've I've come to realize. Yeah, I I'll just close off by saying a few things, Eric. I think you eloquently stated everything, and anything that people can misinterpret will be on them, not us, because we're now infallible. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably would first start by saying, to quote the great Elton John, "I'm still standing," but I would extend that to you, not to speak for you, but on behalf of each other, that we're still standing better than we ever have. 
Um, mm. You know, before it may have been a case of uh, pictures of uh, Dorian Gray, Oscar Wilde, where when we took a look at ourselves, we remained ever eternally youthful and uh, quite frankly, perfect with our opinions. But when we would look at that mirror on the inside, when we look at that photo of ourselves, I wasn't happy with it. It was ugly, man. All those, all that animosity that we carried towards, again, I don't even feel it's important to name the other podcasts, but they know who they are. Um, mm. Just didn't do us any good. And I feel you said you uh, feel like you have a gorilla off your back. I feel the same, my friend. I feel the same. We have two uh, alpha gorillas off of our back, and I just feel relieved. I feel that it's been a fresh new start. I feel that we can maybe attempt now to begin the episode because I, I, I think we've done our part, you know? I don't think we need to apologize oh, yeah. anymore, Eric. Yeah. Well, it's not even us. It just feels so much better to, instead yeah. of being represented by us, to represent ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's a very clear statement. I think it, it lacks any ambiguity and it makes logical sense. So with that, we can move forward into uh, to representing ourselves and discussing this the issue of moderation and, and how that interacts with, with diet in the modern age. So I'll kick it off, Eric. I've, uh, I've seen so many food documentaries, and let's face it, they're popular because we've spoken before about gotcha journalism where it's loaded, there's a clear bias, there's an intent, it's not trying to be impartial, it's trying to tell you a story. And there is always that thin line that becomes blurred when it comes to a documentary where you're attempting to present uh, what you're showing as fact. Um, and Werner Herzog, I'll say just a quick shout out because you know me, I'm a cinephile, love films. He's a great filmmaker, a German filmmaker, but also makes fantastic documentaries. But he talks about the process of creating a documentary. And he essentially said, if I wanted facts, you know, I would read a phone book. A phone book has 5 million facts. I'm after the truth, which is uh, a little bit harder to get after. And you have to be aware of your own biases when you attempt to unravel a story. But we'll see all too often now, food documentaries. I would probably put forth starting with Super Size Me. That was like the proto mm. food documentary that became super popular like anything else with studios. As soon as they see something uh, does well, let's say a Marvel movie, you got to have 30 more, you know? And so there was an appetite, no pun intended, by the audience for more food documentaries. And they followed throughout the last decade. And what has happened essentially is people no longer, or a certain amount of individuals will no longer try and do any research on their own. They'll not even try and refer to magazines, which honestly can also be factually incorrect. They will look for their nutrition information or confirmation of their previously held biases from food documentaries, and that's kind of 2019, the world we live in. You know, I, I don't, I don't disagree at all. I mean, um, I think there have been uh, what, what at least to us appears as very obvious uh, biased perspectives. But um, if you are not someone who is primed to see that, uh, or if your biases have already been primed, um, mm -hmm. you're going to see just kind of the, the aspects of them. Uh, that that sound scientific. If you don't necessarily come to the table with a bias, but you don't understand how to critically appraise information, or if you already have a bias but don't realize how insidious it is in your thinking, you're only going to see the stuff that already confirms it and, and feel much more confident in something that might unfortunately be untrue. And I know there was the uh, the, the big kind of uh, ketogenic uh, pro documentary that came out not too long ago, and now there's the uh, the very popular. Uh, vegetarian or vegan uh, documentary. I've seen previous, um, you know, plant-based documentaries that, that take an ethical angle. This one is the first I've seen that really takes a a performance angle. Um, that that kind of oh, even even argues not only hey you can do this, but it's actually better. Um, so you know the uh, unfortunately that the dogma gets deeper as time goes on, and uh, I think as people respond positively or negatively to these uh there, there's a certain reward of just the hype that these documentaries get and finding that uh the the absurdities that you can go to and, and the limit of how far you can push logical fallacies they kind of realize that oh, doesn't really matter yeah. um in in this in this kind of uh current culture we have um and it's easy to to to, to see this as something new 
Um, but interestingly enough, you know, our tagline, history, science, culture, uh, this goes back to the very beginning of the physical culture days. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if, if anyone who's read uh, Muscle, Smoke, and Mirrors, the, the very first one, uh, it discusses how uh, very early on there was a disassociation between kind of the standard uh, medical model and the health and fitness approach. Uh, one was very uh, kind of curative based and one was preventative based medicine, which included nutrition. And, you know, at the time in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, medicine wasn't great. And, you know, there was a lot of things which were very obviously problematic about it. There wasn't necessarily the scientific method embedded into it. And um, there were a lot of objectively harmful things that were being done. And it was a time in medicine where if it did something, it was used. You know, so like if it made you throw up uh, or if it elicited some type of physiological response, uh, it was very much seen as, okay, we're, we're purging something bad out of you. When in reality, we're actually giving you uh, some type of poisoning, you know, or something like that. Uh, we're giving you mercury and we're, something's happening and that's got to be good. Well, actually not. You still have syphilis and now you're also getting poisoning from mercury, you know, things like that. So it was an understandable pushback then, but it did create this distrust of authority. It did create um, a kind of a wild west of who's in charge of nutrition. Uh, and while the uh, at the time, I think it was really good to have some basic kind of uh, observations and uh, almost kind of home style wisdom from the kind of physical culture community, because it was probably better than some of the, the advice that was out there in the medical community. Um, and, uh, it, it didn't evolve much, you know, with, with, with a very low barrier to entry and a distrust of authority and sometimes even a distrust of science as a whole, science denialism can get wrapped up into that. Uh, it prevents, uh, moving forward and it also really muddies the water and that that's lingering still today in 2019. Um, and, uh, but you can trace it all the way back. Uh, an example, Bernard McFadden, who I brought up a couple times on this podcast, if you go all the way back to our history episodes, love the guy. Don't get me wrong. He brought um, physical culture and bodybuilding to the United States, uh, met uh, Sandow at, at the World Fair, or at least saw him do his thing. And he brought, uh, you know, the first American large scale bodybuilding competition here, I think in 1903, if I got my numbers right. And uh, he was also very ahead of his times in terms of acceptance. You know, he encouraged women to lift weights uh, and, uh, you know, it, we're talking over a hundred years ago that, that that's pretty revolutionary yeah. and um, a lot of good things. He also promoted very extreme diets, fasting for multiple days, um, completely avoiding certain, certain entire categories of food. Uh, and, you know, wasn't really preaching moderation in terms of eating. It was more of uh, some pretty extreme stuff and, and uh, definitely anti medicine at the time, which, like I said, totally understandable in the 1900s and probably better to have, you know, foods. And some of what he said, I really liked. He was very much emphasizing a plant-based diet at that time. Uh, but there's always been this dichotomy in physical culture. There was also the traditional kind of um, more... Ma yes, the York barbell is, is a good example of it, which came around, you know, s some years later uh, uh, with, with Bob Hoffman. But they were a good example, if you were to read the Strength and Health magazines and kind of their guidelines on eating of eat big to get big, have whole, wholesome kind of home style eating, you know, your, your, your heavy protein based diet, your are being a calorie surplus, eat a lot, whole milk, butter, you know, bread, uh, you know, cheese, meats, uh, milk, you know, like lots of milk drinking back in the day. Um, and you kind of had these two almost opposing or in opposition views of the, uh, eat, eat, eat a small amount, eat minimally, uh, longevity-based kind of vegetarian-focused fasting kind of ideas. And then you had the, hey, it's time to put 300 pounds over your head. Uh, be a man. Yeah. Eat all the steak. Drink all the milk. Put butter on your toast. And do it again a couple times per day and, uh, and, and, and eat to grow. And neither one was wrong, um, but neither one was right. <laughs> and that's what's incredible, Eric, why we have as the three pillars – history, science, culture, if you ignore history, it's been said, you're doomed to repeat it. And if we take a look 100 years ago at some of the nutritional dogma, it's not that different than what we see today. And really over the last, let's say, 20 years, while we've been involved in the fitness space, we've seen time and time again, a certain 
uh, <clears throat> point of view, nutritional point of view, where it's needlessly restrictive, usually towards one specific food group. So we'll have the low fat uh, crowd that was probably around, I think, in the 80s. You had the Atkins crew that was lower carbohydrate approach uh, in the 90s. And then now intermittent fasting has been thrown uh, into the mix. And then extended fasting is something over the last several years. And then arguing both for the health and overall efficacy of certain types of diets where, you know, you only need to turn and listen to someone, and this is no insult whatsoever, on someone like Joe Rogan, who's had really good guests. Um, uh, he had Andy Galpin, who is most famous, as he said, for being on Joe Rogan, uh, talking nutrition. Well, but, he was. Yeah. Now yeah. he's most famous for being on Iron Culture. Yeah. Yeah. And his most important work, I would say, for sure. Like, if we had to just make that distinction, at the least, his most important work. I'd say both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're harmonious. I'd agree. Um, mm. If you listen these days, and I, I think we've removed uh, the physical coliseum where gladiators would duke it out, but in the virtual space, it is very much in right now to the same extent, except instead of having these battles in a physical space, it's virtual, it's online. Well, I think purposely people will tend to latch on to a particular dogmatic belief that they, for whatever it might be inherent bias, who knows, or something that appeals to them, and that becomes their identity. And so we'll see online, it's, I, I felt in a way, it's slightly devolved, it depends upon where you're looking, who you're talking to. But I'll even hear Eric these days at the grocery store, something that I wouldn't hear before, uh, you know, I'm a relatively social individual on occasion. And I'll, I'll have conversations or someone will say, I, I noticed someone's loaded up, this individual was loaded up with just bacon in their um, shopping cart. And I just said like, hey, I'm like, that's a lot of bacon is all I said, because he was he, he pointed out at, at a lot of vegetables in his eyes. Maybe I was eating my vegetables, you know? And so I just say, hey, man, that's like, just back, like, that's a lot of bacon. I'm talking probably 20, 30 uh, bacon, uh, you know, packages, and then an assortment of meat. And he said, man, uh, I'm following, you know, whatever, the uh, uh, ketogenic diet, and I've, I've never felt better, you know? I used to, it was, it was vegetables, veg you know, we're not supposed to, and he just said this offhanded, the remark to me, he said, you know, actually, we're not supposed to eat vegetables, right? Like, you know, we're not supposed to do that. And he's just telling it to me. I'm just a random person in, in the grocery store. We struck up a conversation. But this tends to happen a lot more where I think the misinformation I almost would want to argue is higher because at these extreme levels, when everyone's trying to stake a bigger claim, and I think it's partially the algorithms online that reward more sensational headlines. Kind of we think of the headline generation of newspapers, how that influences the news cycle. And that's a fascinating conversation in and of itself. But then as it extends down the road for nutrition, where the more kind of dogmatic you are or the more you select an opinion that is unique, uh, such as I – there, there's an individual, I'm honestly blanking on what it's called. I've heard things like the carnivore diet, the lion diet, you know, a bunch of different things, um, who I think advocates for fasting all like always for, you know, three to four days, regardless of whatever your goal is, it's, this is the most optimal way. Um, these become some of the loudest voices in the room, but it's reassuring, Eric, and often I find my brother, when we have these conversations, just in general, in person, on the podcast, it doesn't really matter, taking a historical look reassures you that these aren't new things, that a lot of the times mm -hmm. that they have a, a historical legacy that we might be slightly ignorant on, and then we could trace that lineage down to today, see where it originates from, and then maybe what needs to be done in order to solve things. I think you really uh, did a great job on the episode with James Krieger, where we we're talking about, I think, insulin and uh, you said essentially where people were saying like, yo, the insulin's the enemy, the carbohydrates are the enemy. And he's like, sure, it's like, let's uh, take a myopic view of selecting one macronutrient and making it evil instead of admitting the fact that there's been a, a you know, multi-billion dollar coalition across countries for years and years, you know, gathering together some of the best scientists to solve some of these issues. And as of yet, we still don't have the answers. It's carbs. So sometimes in the face, and I'm not trying to get too deep, in the face of absolute uncertainty, so when we take a look at it, we have that existential dread, we see comfort in simple answers. Yeah, I think you said that really well. And you also said something uh, I really liked. I think we were t chatting off air, uh, maybe after we talked with Darren or after one of these episodes. 
And you, you pointed out how the viewpoints have become more extreme and that that tells us something. So first, I'm going to say, why do I think viewpoints have become more extreme? And I agree that social media plays a role. You know, back in the early 1900s, um, someone like, uh, you know, Bob Hoffman wouldn't get exposed to uh, something that Bernard McFadden said, uh, even though they're slightly different, uh, you know, time periods. But um, just to give an example, the, the, the typical kind of vegetarian longevity based, including fasting, eat less uh, and, and you focus more on, on, uh, vegetables and stay away from animal products versus the, you know, e eat a lot, uh, eat animal products, drink milk, um, you know, eat everything kind of approach. Uh, those two viewpoints would only get exposed to each other every couple of months when they read an article. Um, but now you have instant access to one another until you decide to block each other because you get so mad. Um, you know, and, and your, your viewpoints are immediately challenged. Uh, and the other person is starting to load their gun before you even finish what you've said. And it actually pushes you away from the mean and, and any point that the person who you have decided as the enemy is made, you're already trying to refute rather than consider. And that's why we now have vegan and the carnivore diet. Uh, when before it was, you know, the, 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 the two opposing groups were a little closer to the middle. You know, it was a low carb versus high carb, low fat versus high fat, uh, you know, and um, and I think you really uh, you pointed out a really important thing about that is that when we get to these extremes, which I do agree is driven large in part by the speed of social media and what is rewarded. We know one thing for sure. Both can't be right. Right. You know, no longer are we dealing with two people who are arguing across one another and who are saying, you know, different things and interpreting, interpreting it mis in incorrectly. Um, now we're dealing with people who are saying literally the polar opposite on purpose, whether they realize it or not, due to this kind of <laughs> adversarial relationship. And now someone is saying that we're not supposed to be eating vegetables. Um, we are only intended by, our, 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 by nature and our biology to be eating meat products. It is a panacea of health and performance. And then literally we have another group saying we are not supposed to be eating meat. Um, we are supposed to only be eating vegetables. It is a panacea for health and performance. And we know one thing for sure. They both can't be right. <laughs> yeah. And I think you, you astutely pointed that out. And in, uh, in most cases when you have that extreme of viewpoints, uh, they, they tend to both be wrong. But I also don't want to fall into the fallacy of uh, always viewing the, the moderate viewpoint as correct. That, that's an easy thing to do. You know, you sound like the smartest. So, so there's step one. How do you sound like the smartest person in the room? Criticize whatever's being said um, and then point out some, some issues with it and you're good to go. Uh, we actually have psychology data showing that criticizing ideas makes you sound smarter than actually coming up with your own. Uh, not that there's no value in criticism. It's just something that people understand. Um, next step, when you have two people criticizing each other, come in and make them both look stupid and take the moderate position. Um, and that, that essentially uh, gives you not only the moral authority of saying, hey, everyone's a little bit right, but also makes you sound like you're smarter than both of them by critiquing both. Now you're not only critiquing one opinion, you're crit critiquing two, right? Yeah. So, but this is not that. Um, because these people have taken the extreme end possible uh, versions of the spectrum, uh, if one is right, man, it, it's if, if the carnivore or the vegan attitude was correct that I that I put forward before that we are s simply not intended to be eating one or the other, and that one is a panacea of health and the other one is, is detrimental, there wouldn't be that dichotomy. If either one was right, there wouldn't be the other position. Right. Just because by observation and trial and error. We would have found out because people are dying at the age of like 25 or unable to perform at all. But we've got Usain Bolt eating chicken McNuggets and running, you know, a 100 meters. And then we've got other athletes following a vegan or vegetarian diet. So clearly performance isn't the deal breaker being whether or not you eat meat or vegetables primarily. Uh, and we have the same thing in bodybuilding. We have the same thing with people living a very long time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually are pretty confident that they're both wrong. And it's not that we're trying to sound smart and be the moderate position. It's that when you take the most extreme position possible, you're almost certainly wrong. Uh, it's not just a relative extreme position compared to what is currently thought of in, in society. <sighs> Eric, 
Very well put. I mean, we we know from the intro that we we the two of us co-founders of Iron Culture can never be wrong. But for the average person listening, those are some very useful tips. I think it actually would be an interesting conversation later on when we talk about the concept of moderation. Where once again, yeah, I need. I'm gonna give you a compliment, Roth Camera. You're talking about what what is even moderation? If it's you know the mean or the middle between two extremes, is that necessarily even a good thing? And if you read Aristotle, who has been quoted incorrectly so often the concept of the golden mean he talks much about what you're indicating right there where we first need to define what moderation means where sometimes being the sensible person is like well we first need to define what those extremes are before we do that eric i do want to provide some utility because iron culture that's what we're all Mm. about we're trying to uh you know instruct based upon what we know inspired by our Honestly, by Eric's polo, who is just popping out of it. I mean, it's a it's a visual splendor. If you're if you're only on the audio, I understand, and a lot of people listen on the commute to work. But we got what, what is that seventeen point? What, what I, I don't even want to define it because it's undefinable. Um, all I know is that the singularity approaches when I look at that bicep peak, my friend. Um, I think it'd be helpful to give some information regarding vegetarian diets. It's not helpful for us to go over the latest documentary, Game Changers. And that's basically because we were asked by individuals, the latest uh, documentary this time is a vegan documentary. And we're going to set aside the ethical considerations and just talk about the nutrition. Because I think all too often, individuals, they want that one size fits all. I understand for ethical reasons, you want to be vegan, more power to you. And then wait a second, I want to make this a position then that it's just the best overall. It's also the best nutritionally. It's far superior to any other uh, potential nutrition program that one can follow. And we won't comment on Game Changers itself because once again, I think it's far more important to try and give some utility. Oh, you're vegetarian, you're vegan. Uh, What are some considerations you should have? But essentially, in this time, in 2019 or it doesn't really matter because if we look a hundred years ago, once uh, again at individuals like Bernard McFadden, you want to take a look at if you can what some of the research shows, or as close to the data or the sources as you can be. And by the time you watch a documentary, it has been reinterpreted some of that information where it no longer even remotely resembles the truth. And so it's almost like a broken telephone that intentionally the line has been kinked one way and. In essence, it almost becomes propaganda. So the utility, I think, of Iron Culture, one of them, is to try and provide the correct information. So I think, Eric, maybe we shout out also Mass, where you have an excellent presentation, a two-part presentation on vegetarian and vegan diets. I'm going to let you take over then and actually discuss some of those nutritional considerations for vegetarian and vegan athletes. Absolutely. I think um, it's easy to be that that the, the person in the room. We do this all the time in the in the quote unquote evidence based community where we debunk something, point out intellectual fallacies, sound really smart, and you know, put on our nerd glasses and look, everyone's wrong, we're right, and here's the way you should think because I'm so smart. Um, I don't think there's a lot of utility in that. I think what I I don't want to convince people that that we're correct or we have all the answers. I want to help people understand something. And uh, to get a really good idea of what was the issue with Game Changers and almost all of these food documentaries, regardless of the position they take, I would actually direct people to uh, probably a little known podcast that's on the rise, the Stronger by Science podcast, um, and listen to the episode where Greg Knuckles and uh, Derek I, Trexler discuss I this. Yeah, I can't. What, so what is the second host name? They have, I know Greg Knuckles of Sonic and Knuckles, mm. but so what is his name again? He, it's just so forgettable. Pretty sure it's Derek Trexler. Derek, yeah, yeah. I thought it was Darren, but... Uh, I, I might. You would know oh, better shit. than I. No, 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 no. I would, and it's Aaron Drexler. So yes, Aaron. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And that's the one. Yeah. Good guy. Good guy. Up and comer. You know, he. Uh, I think. I don't know if he's going to make it. Make it. But I think he's definitely going to be able to survive with his uh, his solid B B plus content. You know. <laughs> uh, anyway, so if, if you want to check out a really, really above average podcast, uh, they did an excellent job talking about. Uh, kind of some of the issues with these documentaries in general. So you can have better armed critical thinking skills when next time uh, it pops up across your Netflix suggestions or 
you know, someone catches you at the grocery store and, and tells you that <laughs> we're not intended to eat broccoli or what have you. So anyway, with that said, there are plenty of people who might decide to follow a, a plant-based diet, vegan diet, vegetarian diet, flexitarian diet, lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet, pescatarian diet, etc. And there are typically three reasons uh, why that happens. Um, for one, people might state they want to do it for health. Uh, two, people might state they want to do it for the performance benefits. Uh, this is was actually much less common until recently because the big kind of focus of Game Changers was on these athletes. And then three, they might decide they want to do it for ethical reasons. Uh, so when I'm approached with someone who has questions about uh, following one of these diets, the first thing I, I want to make sure I'm not doing is strawmanning them or misrepresenting them or putting them into a category or box. I really want to listen because um, I personally have had people approach me like, hey, don't you know it's not better for, uh, for health or performance to follow a plant-based diet? Uh, and because they might have heard that I follow a flexitarian diet or that I was lacto vegetarian for a couple of years or that I'm largely pescatarian, etc. Uh, and that's basically an assumption. And they've already made me an enemy. They've already misunderstood me, misrepresented me and made me feel stupid. They've condescended to me. And uh, it, it, even though I, I know what, what the information they have and even though I know what their intentions are, it does piss me off. And I imagine, man, if I didn't have that foreknowledge... Uh, I would be very close-minded to those opinions. So it's counterproductive to not consider who am I talking to and to put them into a box before you listen. So first off, uh, it's, it's, I think it's pretty easy to address the, I'm doing this for, for moral or ethical reasons. Uh, first off, you know, morality, ethics is, an, is a personal choice, and that is something that's going to be based on your values. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you what your values or personal choices should be. Um, but... I think someone who does decide to follow a plant-based diet purely for ethical reasons, uh, and to whatever degree that is, you, you, maybe you've decided I am still going to eat meat or animal products, but I just don't want to consume them uh, from non-sustainable sources, if, if that's your concern about the environment, or I don't want to consume uh, animals that are slaughtered in a certain way uh, for religious considerations, or I'm not going to eat anything uh, that had to go through a factory farming process, or I'm just going to, you know just to kind of wipe the slate clean. I'm going to stay away from all animal products or all meat and be totally vegetarian and totally vegan just because I, I, I can't kind of follow all the different ways in which the meat is produced, which is understandable. Um, and if that's the case, I go, hey, that's great that you're thinking about this from ethical or environmental reasons, um, but it is going to affect your, your, your health and performance to some degree. You're probably talking to me because you lift weights and you care about these outcomes. So let me help you uh, set that up in the best way possible. And that's where the conversation starts with utility. If someone comes to me with uh, the belief uh, that it is better for health or better for performance, uh, first, I want to make sure that they're coming to me not just to, you know, basically make a comment, but it actually is a question. And that's something <laughs> that, you know, Omar and anyone who is an information purveyor or acts in a way of being an educator understands is that sometimes people will raise their hand and ask a quote unquote question when really it's just they want the space to make a comment and they're not necessarily open to anything. So it's good to confirm with them, hey, so just w wanted to check in. Are you looking for my my advice or my take on that? And if the answer is not a pretty unequivocal well, yes, then I just go, okay, no worries. Thanks for, for chiming in and I move on. But if the person is open to it and they have a prior belief, um, let's start with the health one. And I would say there's a ton of data when looking at population-based uh, data that indeed, uh, vegetarians and vegans uh, typically have better health uh, and, and lower risks of developing uh, certain diseases and typically over the time period studied, a low, lower chance of dying uh, when you look at uh, hazard ratios than uh, just your general omnivore who might be studied. Uh, but one thing you have to realize is that someone who has decided to make such a substantial lifestyle change to their nutrition typically has also made other lifestyle changes. If you take a random vegetarian, they're more likely to not smoke, not drink in excess, uh, get more sleep, have a lower BMI, exercise, and be generally health conscious and more active. So that is, all of those can have a potential impact on all those other outcomes that I talked about in terms of health and mortality risk, et cetera. And when you start to take these large scale studies where you compare a uh, vegetarian to a comparable omnivore who also uh, is exercising, not smoking, not drinking to excess, active, has a low BMI, 
all of these mortality uh, risk, uh, higher higher mortality risks and, and risk of developing disease in the vast majority of studies, sometimes I'm talking about studies on 20,000 people plus, uh, they start to wash out mm-hmm. and you don't see them. On top of that, even though we, we, we have some confidence that, that those risk factors can be uh, ameliorated just by simply having good comparisons, these are simply just observational studies. We don't have 20-year studies where we've intervened and put someone on a vegan diet or a carnivore diet. Ethically, that's probably not going to fly. Um, and also, it's just simply impossible from a scientific perspective. We can't lock people into some kind of microcosm where there's either no plants or no animals available for, for consumption for their entire life to see what happens. So the best we have are two types of studies. Short-term RCTs looking at the effects of individual nutrient items, and they're typically not going to last more than six months, or these observational studies. And overall, we see that there's almost no singular nutrients that are harmful at all, which I'm going to come back to, be they plant or animal, for all people who have a normal health status. And two, uh, in the observational studies, we see that, hey, uh, once you control for all those factors, vegetarian diets are not more healthy uh, than, than, than well set up uh, diets that include meat. So from a health perspective, I think the best view, now going back to what I said about inclusion versus exclusion, is that plants are good. It's not that animal products are bad. Um, so in general, uh, I think a good way to view nutrition is that excluding dose, excluding frequency of, of, of an individual nutrient, and I'm talking even about stuff like trans fats, high fructose corn syrup, sugar, all the stuff that we have identified as quote unquote bad, uh, either in terms of pure accuracy for actual physiological effects or because of the effects on displacing other calories, uh, driving up hunger so that you overeat and then then the negative effects on health, et cetera. If you exclude the idea of frequency and magnitude, there is no bad foods. Um, Nothing is going to hurt you that is a normal food product you can buy at the grocery store if you eat it just once, regardless of how much, you know, a small bite of a Twinkie will not end your life or have any measurable effect. Um, even a, even a, a teaspoon of, of trans fat on the tongue is not going to do anything to you uh, if you did that once on a Wednesday. So really what we're looking at is at best or at worst, I should say, empty calories or calories that can displace other things in the diet. So that means that you can construct a diet that consists of either primarily plants uh, or maybe not primarily, but certainly includes a fair amount of animal products while also eating a lot of plants that are going to be equivalent in terms of health. And on the extreme ends, if you were to eat a vegan diet, uh, there are things, because we are omnivores, that would not be included. So for example, vitamin B12 is simply not in a vegan diet as it comes almost exclusively uh, from, from animal products. Uh, likewise, even if you're a lacto ovo vegetarian, and we talked about this with Darren Kandow, it's really difficult to get in enough creatine, which now we're seeing um, might even be viewed as more than just a performance enhancing supplement, but as something that is important for health. Uh, and you will see lower levels of creatine in lacto ovo vegetarians and vegans. And supplementing with creatine can actually have positive cognitive effects and enhanced uh, effects, even compared to someone normally supplementing with creatine who is an omnivore uh, when you compare it to a vegetarian. So from a health perspective, uh, a vegan diet certainly can be a fantastically healthy diet, but it requires a little more attention and education because you're removing some of your omnivorous roots as a human. Uh, likewise, you can certainly include uh, you know, meats, dairy, and animal products so long as you eat a robust amount of fruits and vegetables, and that will be a healthy diet that requires probably a little less education beyond just knowing, hey, I should eat the colors and I should eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Now, I've been monologuing a lot, but I've covered the health aspect. I've covered the ethics a- a- aspect. And I know this is iron culture, but before I get, in- get into how to be an effective iron gamer on a plant-based diet, Omar, is there anything you want to say? No, you're just putting on a clinic. It's a free clinic for the people, to the people, by the co-founders. I would just say uh, I-, I would ask the question because there's individuals always, as soon as 
you bring up uh, the word vegan or vegetarian diet where they're concerned, and that's why I'm glad you're about to get to the performance side, that they won't be able, in quotations, to perform as well, right? Where they'll talk about, mm. well, what about even things that have been disproven the concept of protein sources, right? As long as you get a, a wide yeah. variety of protein sources because they're incomplete in quotations. Amino acids, like, you know, uh, you're a, for some reason, protein synthesis is not going to occur. So a lot of that, I think, has been washed out over time. Um, and I do, and I will say this, Eric, can I, uh, can I announce what you are in terms of your, your own nutrition? You said you're a flexitarian, that you're currently a flexitarian, right? Correct. So I, I trend more towards, uh, pescatarian when I have, for example, uh, when I'm dieting, because I think it, it is, it is helpful to have a higher protein intake and that's difficult to do while keeping fats and carbs a little lower when you're on a pure lacto vegetarian diet or gets very monotonous and I have to consume a whole lot of, uh, you know, Greek yogurt and a whole lot of egg whites if I want to do that. So I, I trend towards uh, using uh, pole caught fish in my diet a lot and sustainably caught fish. So I become much more pescatarian when I am dieting. And then when I'm not dieting, I'm much more of a lacto vegetarian. No, I respect that. I remember when we were out hanging about what you did. I, my only question concerning that before basically we continue is, did you decide to become flexitarian because it has the word flex in it? Is that how you discovered Correct. it? Correct. Okay, yeah. That, and then the ethical considerations, you're like, yeah, sure, whatever, blah, 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 help the animals, cool. Flexitarian. Yeah, I mean, if you put the word flex in a diet, <laughs> there's a strong chance I'm going to follow it. Yeah. And it just so happens that the flexitarian diet also roughly describes and represents uh, my, my, my ethical considerations. So yeah. it, it's, it was a fortunate coincidence because yeah. if there was a flexitarian diet that was only eating like live animals who'd been tortured, man, I, ha I hate to say it, but I might be following it because of the name alone. Well, you know, coincidence, serendipity. I say it's fortuitous. Serendipity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I would say now, now you've touched on everything, man. I would definitely say, uh, talking about the performance side and what I really liked the way that you described everything, it wasn't accusatory in the slightest when you uh, spoke about either the ethical considerations, someone choosing to do this, the health concerns where some people might, you know, again, because sometimes we want everything all at once to go, well, this, you know, I'm deciding to make this choice. Uh, it's almost, this is a very shitty analogy, but you know, when you decide to invest in something or buy something, you start kind of looking for reasons. You want something, you start looking for reasons to justify it. You have the base internal desire, which might be your big mover, but then you're looking for secondary tertiary reasons why this must be the thing. So I thought you did a great overview. Mm. And I think the last one, which is more unique on the uh, Game Changers documentary, is the argument uh, for performance superiority via a, a plant-based diet. I think talking about performance now as it actually relates to a plant-based diet would be fantastic. I absolutely will. And I think before I do, you pointed out some really, really important things is that um, there is a danger that when one makes the decision that you believe that ethically or morally or due to your values, a plant-based diet is better. Um, there's nothing wrong with making that decision. But you have to hold on to the fact that that is your own personal moral belief. And, and maybe you even believe that others should do it too. However, um, when you feel you have morality on your side or you have the big T truth on your side, it is much easier to follow a, a means to an end philosophy. Uh, this is mean, meaning that, you know what? Uh, I am fine with representing a vegan diet as better for performance or better for health if it results in more people following it because then it, it makes the world a better place. Uh, there's going to be less uh, animals getting killed. There's going to be less harm, less suffering in the world. And that's a, a moral concession that is much easier to make once you believe you have what is something morally right on your side. And this is problematic because you have to assume that you have the one true view of morality and, and values. And I'm not saying you shouldn't stand by your personal convictions, but you need to have a little bit of humility and a little bit of perspective and compassion for other people that their individual life experiences and the position they are in life are going to result in slightly different values that we can't objectively say are, are better or worse. So instead of following that slippery slope right down into hell uh, and turning uh, diet into basically American politics... Uh, by going a means to an end philosophy, creating, you know, basically, hey, I will say anything I can to, to prevent you from voting for the other guy, 
or hopefully in the future, the other gal, um, because I've decided that that viewpoint is morally incorrect and vice versa. Uh, and what that results in is that everyone is destroyed. All things are have become questioned. Uh, fake news is, is, is confused with real news. And we have a situation where we have no faith in the people who are supposed to be representing us in our society. society. So that's the outcome if we want to play that game. So instead of, uh, if you know uh, that, that you are trending towards arguments that may or may not be fully factually correct because you believe you have morality on your side, I would really caution you away from that. I understand it. Uh, and it's an understandable place to be, but it's a very dangerous place to be. So like you said, once you've decided something is right or correct, it's going to start creating this filter where your biases now see anything that results in that are also correct. Um, and that's something I had to check in myself because obviously I started eating the way I do for uh, moral reasons. And it would be easy for me to look at the data on uh, health in a way that would go, yeah, vegan diets are more healthy or plant-based diets are more healthy. But I've tried to be honest. And I think my, my best take on it uh, is that, man, plants are good, but it's not the exclusion of animal products uh, that is necessarily better. So anyway, with that said, um, not only do we have these internal biases that come when we have a moral position uh, we also get these biases that come when we are in an adversarial discussion with someone else. So once I've decided you're on the opposite team and I'm on this team and we have this kind of quote unquote tribalism, you tend to reject everything associated with the other person's position rather than simply the things you actually disagree on. And so protein intake is a really good example when you start to look at uh, vegan diets for performance or vegetarian athletes. Um, instead of what you will hear much less frequently uh, the argument that you can have a high protein and high protein quality on a vegetarian diet, you will hear an attack on protein itself. And protein basically becomes this bystander in, in this shootout between uh, vegans and, and omnivores, right? Um, and they will cite whatever research, even if it's inappropriate, to dismiss the importance of protein. You know, they'll cite the RDA, even though they damn know, know, they know you, you're sure they know better. They might have had a very articulate reason uh, explaining the benefits of certain plants and phytonutrients and it's super articulate. And they point out all the issues and maybe the potential cancer causing factors of charred meat. And they've clearly read deep into the literature, but then they'll go ahead and cite a uh, 1990 World Health Organization position for why you should only eat 60 grams of protein per day. So they will close themselves off to uh, the best quality evidence if it supports their position and not even, even not even realizing it necessarily. Um, so yeah, if you look at sports nutrition and nutrition in general, you can find protein recommendations that range from 0 0.8 grams per kg, all the, which is, man, like that's like 0.3 grams per pound, you know, um, all the way up to uh, over a gram per pound in certain circumstances and, and, and situations. Like a dieting athlete might be recommended 2.7 grams per kg. Or if you look at some of Jose Antonio's research, when he's talking about it from a purely body composition standpoint, not necessarily hypertrophy, uh, but allowing you to eat more calories or inducing satiety or increasing dietary induced thermogenesis, man, eating as high as uh, higher than three grams per kg could be, could be helpful in some cases. So that's a huge broad spectrum. And if you see someone who's an omnivore or on the carnivore based uh, diet promoting the highest intake, or if you see someone on a vegan diet promoting the lowest intake, that gives you a sense of their bias. Um, probably the most accurate position is that a higher than minimal protein intake is best for performance. You know, we know from the latest data, somewhere between 0 0.7 to 1 gram per pound is the range that's going to most likely support maximally strength and hypertrophy in people who lift weights if they're not dieting. Recent meta-analysis led by Rob Morton that I had the fortune of being a part of. Now, then, then the question becomes, well, is that an appropriate intake regardless of what type of protein you eat? And the commonly cited issue with vegan diets you started to get into is that uh, vegan diets lack all of the essential amino acids. So uh, protein quality uh, is typically dictated by whether or not, because we don't actually have a protein requirement, right? We have, an we have an amino acid requirement. And we have nine essential amino acids, and then we have a host of other non-essential amino acids. And anytime we're talking about an essential nutrient, an essential nutrient is dictated by whether or not our body can or cannot produce it. So essential nutrients we have to get from the diet. Non-essential nutrients we can produce through biochemical conversions in our body. So many of plant-based sources don't have all nine essential amino acids in enough abundance to call them complete. 
So the typical, uh, you know, advice you'll hear from a nutritionist, or you might have heard in your Nutrition 101, or even your health class in high school, would be, hey, if you eat, you know, bread with peanut butter on it, or if you eat rice and beans together, those would be quote unquote complementary proteins because what essential amino acids one of those food groups misses, the other one has. So they complement each other. In reality, we don't need to think about this on a meal meal to meal basis or food combination, but over over the whole diet because digestion time course is pretty long in most cases. So, so long as you have a vegan diet that has mixed sources of plant-based foods, you're probably okay. And then the primary focus needs to be, in: are you getting adequate protein? Uh, and if you have a non-supplemented vegan diet, uh, meaning you're not taking any kind of protein supplements, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, you may be smarter to trend towards the higher end of that range of 0.7 to say one gram per pound. I'd probably advise you be around 0.9 to one gram per pound so that the sheer quantity of protein makes up for the potential shortfalls in certain essential amino acids. And that's more from a health and a general kind of perspective of covering all your bases. With that said, um, there are ways where you don't necessarily need to eat a higher protein intake to make up for the shortfall if you do have a different type of protein quality, which is viewed more from the performance perspective. So any protein researcher in sports nutrition, they talk a lot about leucine and the branch chain amino acids and the, and the essential amino acids because they're largely the specific amino acids which trigger adaptations in muscle. So leucine, often uh, cited as the kind of the, the engine, uh, sorry, the key that starts the engine of your car. If, if muscle protein synthesis is your car, it's got an engine, it's got a gas tank. Leucine is the key uh, in, 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 the, in the ignition. And then all the other essential amino acids are basically the fuel for the tank, and then that engine can run. Uh, you're not going to be turning on that process without leucine, and you're not going to be able to build a lot of muscle without the other amino acids to actually construct a muscle protein. So essentially, if you look at protein quality from this perspective, you can have a complete protein source like soy, for example. Uh, but soy, while it has all of the essential amino acids, it's relatively low in these in these specific uh, muscle-related amino acids like leucine and the branch chain, chain amino acids compared to something like a casein or a whey or most animal sources. And when you do super short-term comparisons of the muscle protein synthesis response to whey or soy, whey typically beats out soy. Um, and that only is an issue if your if your diet is dominated by these complete but low quote unquote protein quality from a kind of hypertrophy standpoint proteins. But there's many, many other options besides soy. In fact, some of the most uh, popular protein supplements these days are pea-based proteins. And pea protein or pea rice blends actually have a very similar amino acid profile when looking at these specific amino acids like leucine to that of whey. So as an example, if you simply were to have a relatively high protein diet, like I cited as a vegan, say 0 0.9 to 1 gram per pound per day from mixed uh, you know, plant-based sources, and then, you know, post-workout, you had a 20 to 40 gram shake of pea or pea and rice blend, you would be just as good as an omnivore and you'd have all your bases covered. Uh, and you wouldn't have to create some silly argument where you felt comfortable only taking in 1.2 grams per kg because of this one study you found where it wasn't better than, than say, 2 grams per kg. And when in reality, the data largely leans towards a higher intake being superior. Yeah, I uh, just want to have one minor clarification uh, for everyone out there. So just so we don't get involved in another controversy, uh, Eric, this is in a R. Kelly type of pea protein. Uh, this is, in fact, a pea protein, P-E-A. And I have absolutely no doubt that that is exactly what Eric meant. But just so we don't get into any hot water or lukewarm water, um, I just wanted mm. to clarify that. But you nailed it. You know, the, the, the best thing about that is when you started to bring it up, I had, <laughs> I had two thoughts in my head. One would be the, the high expectation of Omar, the, uh, the, the, the best expectation of my friend Omar, that, that I made some misstatement mm -mm. about amino acids. Like maybe I said there's only eight essential amino acids, which used to be taught in textbooks when I was in a, you know, going through my bachelor's. And I actually got called out when I was on 50% facts because I said there's eight essential amino acids. Someone took a shot at me and I was like, hey... All you know from that is that the first time I got certified as a personal trainer, it was like 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, or I thought he may make a joke about, you know, green peas and the word pea 
sounding like urine. And I was like, no, nah, he wouldn't do that. But you didn't disappoint. Oh, yeah. You brought it down. You Like, you know, people say never change. Yeah. Even when you probably should change and become more educated and more adult, yeah. you're like, no, I'm not going to. And I respect that. Yeah, I, I'm steadfast in my immaturity. Um, and I would say your mistake, Eric, was the fact that you thought you made a mistake. You know, because once again, as we showed at the beginning of the episode, uh, we are never incorrect. And and I wouldn't say what we say is gospel, but if mm. someone should choose to view it as such and then write it down and collect it in a book, um yeah and call it something like the muscle church i wouldn't be opposed man uh yeah and then and then if that person was happy to take a one percent commission as we sold that <laughs> as a pdf uh download yeah. for i don't know a, a reasonable value for something that is quite literally and figuratively gospel maybe a thousand dollars yeah that's 10 bucks per sale that you're gonna get dude okay okay so anyone who wants to make that pdf just saying there's an offer on the table for you to make 10 bucks per sale of the uh, the Muscle Church gospel. Yeah, there's 20,000 souls listening to every single episode. I know one of you knows how to operate a PDF, uh, uh, you know, uh, Adobe in order to make a PDF. You're out there. Mm-hmm. Contact us. Do your best. We're in. I think, Eric, uh, in all seriousness, um, because there is that, I, I must say, and I thank everyone that listens to Iron Culture. It's such a great community. And they say... So many positive things like, hey, man, we love your banter. In fact, someone in a recent episode, which I'll read in another one because it's just, it's so nice. It brings me to tears. It's like, these guys, their banter feels, doesn't feel forced. It's as good as the best of them out there. Like, they brought up Grand Tour, which is not a non-fitness podcast, and I love it. There are some people, though. There's someone who was a German speaker who said, honestly, their American sense of humor, uh, it just kind of flies right over me. So I don't understand it. I, I kind of uh. am here just to learn information and so i want to dance now that we now that we brought up i believe i could fly uh i want to dance back over <laughs> to the vegetarian a uh, common uh, uh tree and just say that eric i i think that you answered every single important question i think you framed it correctly where you had the three different distinctions of health uh ethical reasons and performance and you did a great overview talking about performance and how essentially if your goal is to get most jacked and very strong following a vegetarian pescatarian vegan diet you'll be fine you will be fine and i think the the time when it takes a little more attention to detail is when you are uh fully vegan uh, because like I said, we are omnivores and that's certainly, I'm not going to follow the naturalistic fallacy. You know, we're far, we're so far. F- it, how ironic would it be for me to talk about what's natural as you're listening to me on a social media platform on a, a an iPhone and I'm talking to you through a condenser mic while I'm speaking to someone in Canada over Skype. Like it's ridiculous. <laughs> like we're, we're like, I'm a natural bodybuilder, but I'm also on Skype, you know, <laughs> to, talking in two different time zones, and you're listening to me through electronic waves and all kinds of magic. So just because we're naturally omnivores doesn't mean that that's the choice in 2019 that you should do. Um, and if you choose to be vegan, uh, you will have to pay a little more attention to be a little more educated so that you are fine and you don't lose any performance. I don't even think it's necessarily a concession when you do it right. It just requires more effort. But when once you understand the differences and you put forth that effort, then that effort's done. It just becomes habits. So there's a few things to consider. Um, if you are vegan, uh, for one, uh, you're not going to be getting B12 in your diet. Yeah. So that's something you probably want to make sure that you're taking a multivitamin that includes B12. Um, there are a few other things that might be low in your diet. Uh, f- due to bioavailability or a lack of the nutrients. So I would really recommend actually taking creatine, not even seeing it as a perform- performance-enhancing substance, uh, but actually seeing it as an essential nutrient if you are a, a vegan or even a lacto-vegetarian because it's largely present in meat. A um, couple other things you might want to consider as a full-blown vegetarian might be taurine. Uh, if you're on a low-sodium diet, uh, iodine could be potentially low in your diet as well. Um, and Uh, Also, uh, beta alanine becomes something that you might want to take. The whole reason we take beta alanine is to get muscle carnosine levels up. And carnosine, there's a reason why carne is the start of that. That is largely also present in animal products. Um, So carnitine, uh, carnosine via beta alanine, creatine, uh, taurine, uh, and iodine, and calcium, and iron are all potential shortfalls. Not necessarily. You'd have to have a pretty poorly constructed vegan diet to be deficient in all of them or dieting on a vegan diet. Um, 
But the cool thing is that if you look at some of the well-constructed uh, vegan multivitamins and some of the well-constructed pre-workout supplements, like I can think of a number of pre-workout supplements that have creatine, mm. beta alanine, um, and uh, also taurine in them. Yeah. And you've got those, 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 those bases all covered. So the first thing I would do if you decide to be on a, on a vegan diet is I would regularly get some blood work done and assess your diet to make sure you actually are uh, deficient before you just start randomly supplementing with things. I think B12 is probably the only non-negotiable for a vegan. And then consider those other factors. Get your uh, get your get your levels checked for for D3 also because that's that's largely we get it from sunlight, but it also comes in the form of of, uh, of eating animal based products often. Uh, and the good news is you can get um, so if you don't eat fish and you want to get, let's say, more omega-3s in your diet, you can take algae-based fish oil. The reason why fish have uh, EPA and DHA, that's the omega-3 acids we're after, is because they eat algae. So you can just directly eat the algae. Um, also, if you're trying to get more D3 in your diet, or sorry, more vitamin D in your diet, there's two forms typically that people take in supplemental form, D2 and D3. D2 is much less bioavailable and doesn't have much of an impact on your actual levels in your body. D3 has a much better profile. And now there's actually, I believe, lichen-based uh, D3. So that is a way to get D3 with, from a vegetarian-sourced uh, supplement, which is great. Um, you know, creatine is created in a lab. It's not from animals. So, you, you know, you take basically the same thing I'd recommend to an om omnivore, like the typical quote-unquote stack for a bodybuilder. Uh, assuming they've got some blood work and confirm that these are things they benefit from taking would be, you know, one to 3000 I use, depending on body mass and sun exposure of D3, you know, one to two grams per day of EPA and DHA, maybe through fish oil, if they're fine with that, or through algae based supplementation, uh, creatine, um, beta alanine, if they're crossfitter or bodybuilder in a high rep, uh, phase, uh, and then, um, caffeine, which is, you know, a non-issue for both omnivores and, and vegans alike. Uh, and potentially citrulline malate as the, the data lean in that way, which also is a, a non-animal uh, based product. And you can get just a slightly different formula for your you know, pre-workout sup, if you will, uh, to be a vegan to have a few extra ingredients to include, say, taurine, for example, or do beta alanine, even if you're not a bodybuilder or a crossfitter, uh, and you're good to go. And it requires the same amount of a supplement bill for the most part. And instead of buying whey, you would just get a pea blend and you're there. And then it's just constructing a good diet that has a lot of variety. <sighs> Helping out too many people, Eric. It's just what you can't, you can't help but help people. And I respect that about you. I would say maybe a closing note on the discussion regarding uh, vegetarians, vegans. I found myself internally remarking um, when mm. listening to Joe Rogan, actually, when he would talk, he would just, you know, make these claims. W one of the things, and, you know, we're basically calling this, we're never appearing on Joe Rogan, and we're perfectly content with this because we burn bridges wherever we can. Mm. It, I, I joke when I say this, but, you know, I don't think he's vocalized the fact that on it, which is a company that I don't think he directly owns, but, you know, is a huge sponsor of his, is, let's say, keto uh, bias, uh, biased in favor of uh, keto-based products. But he'll make certain claims like, oh, I, I know a bunch of athletes. As soon as they switch to keto, man, they feel incredible. Um, but conversely, some individuals where there's someone I showed you, Eric, that Icarus designed. The, uh, she's German, and she tried to go vegan for ethical reasons. And something that I'll hear from certain individuals when they don't plan it out is that they feel either tired, lethargic, um, they they make all these big changes, but they're not taking a look at the musical whole, and as a result, they become deficient. And if your if the entirety of your view of switching to in in a big city like Toronto, unfortunately, this could be the case uh, to be, become vegan is like, well, I'm just going to do uh, uh, vegan substitutes. So there's a place here that's burgers, French fries, this and that. If you're essentially eating still highly processed foods that are devoid of micronutrients as the majority of your food intake, then it's not actually the uh, vegetarian or vegan diet that you're uh, that's the problem. You're just eating like shit. So. I, I would say oh, yeah. for individuals, just just to be aware of what's actually causing things where some of the claims, once again, oh man, I feel so low energy when I do that. It's like, yeah, you're eating, you have, there's not, a, there's nary 
a vegetable in sight, despite calling yourself a vegetarian. And as a quick personal side note, I think if I ever was to lean in that direction, the two uh, cultural food groups I would be eating all the damn time, bro. Ethiopian food, which naturally separates meat and vegetables, and Indian food, which they've already got that shit down to science, the spices. They know things we don't know, okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, there. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing. Some of these times, these are first world problems where a lot of uh, societies have either days or fully uh, vegetarian options all the time because economically, it's just not reasonable for them to have meat on on a regular basis. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, uh, and I really like what you said about how it's understandable. Like if you get exposed to to some information that you find out about uh, the way animal products are processed or the way that uh, animals are killed for consumption and it just horrifies you and you decide to make like look i can't do this anymore like i now when i see a steak i see something i'm ethically uncomfortable with you might make a change tomorrow you know that's 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 the positive side of these strong ethical beliefs and value-based decisions about your diet it's much easier to adhere to them and make the change you don't have to convince yourself to stop eating you know steak because uh, i don't know it's bad for me or heart health or or my personal trainer said so like it's now this strong intrinsic motivation but that can happen without education. So, for example, if if sixteen year old Eric had somehow decided to be a lacto over vegetarian, oh, no. I would just be eating cheese all the time. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> nothing else. Like, oh, I like cheese. So, wait, I can have nachos. Awesome. It would be nachos. <laughs> It'd be the nacho diet, yeah. and nothing else with you know vegetarian nachos would be it. So, yeah, that that's problematic. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you did a really good job of pointing that out, bringing that up, and uh, and yeah, the. The, the thing you brought up about people having biases and, uh, you know, making sure we're not getting on Joe Rogan. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that because we, we don't need that. We're, we're above it. Yeah. And it'd be weird to have podcast hosts on a podcast anyway. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, t I totally agree. Uh, it's very important to be able to assess your own biases. Make sure that you're educated and, uh, and actually recognize that when you modify your nutrition, you're modifying a lot. That's how you interact with others. You're modifying your social life. You're modifying your health. Uh, you're modifying your impact on the world. You know, uh, very much in any society, what you pay for and what you put your dollars towards, you're essentially quote unquote voting for mm -hmm. or putting your, uh, your your power behind. You're 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 encouraging that even in some small way. So I, I think it's important to uh, to realize that that your ethics, your life, your social interactions are all tied to your diet and. Asking people or willy-nilly suggesting certain diets to be a certain way should really not be done lightly. I almost feel that these are I, I've felt a few times we've had some mic drop moments where it's like, you know what? When you're when you're, you know, in improvisation, and I know Eric knows this, you you want to crescendo to a certain point where the scene either climaxes or what have you uh, what have you, and then you end it because you know what? You reached it. You you feel you reached the conversation. We could but I think now dovetailing it into the second portion of the conversation to talk about moderation, which has been a through mm. thread throughout the entirety of Iron Culture, um, talking about what moderation actually means. And I think mm. it's rough uh, these days out on them streets trying to sell creatine. Nobody wants creatine anymore. They're talking about it. It's a taurine they're talking about the latest things they're talking about beta alanine um mm. which is problematic for individuals that don't view themselves as beta um just the name alone kind of triggers them um they they wished uh, yeah you you could you could create a beta alanine product called alpha, alpha alanine yeah yeah you know what's funny you do well here's what's super sad i guarantee if you didn't inform consumers but you just had those two products a beta alanine and an alpha alanine and, you know, they're just looking and the same label, like basically same label. What would they buy more? It's time to get alpha, bro. If you bought alpha alanine, you'd automatically become beta, which is a construct <laughs> that I don't even recognize. But in your case, I would recognize it. So, yeah. <laughs> your paradigm's bullshit. But with that being said. But I'll let you fit yourself into it, but only the bad part. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> um, I, th I think a brief conversation on moderation where we see how mm. this extends now to training overall where uh different training modalities that people would be uh, huge advocates of where a sensible approach and that's why i think it's fantastic when you actually examine the data eric concerning something like a full body training approach right for a natural athlete are there 
really any contraindications was, oh my God, you cannot do it. You want to do full body and be natural? You shouldn't. But the common wisdom would be counter to that. And I think uh, mm. training, because emotions are high, uh, often when people get into lifting weights, they uh, start for a variety of reasons, and that's fine, but it can compel them to do certain things. Oh, man, I got to rest a certain amount of time. I got to do this. I got to do that. Where we see some of those approaches, or there's that allure of uh, even West Side. let's talk about for powerlifting, where it's like, you know what? If you're not bleeding through your nose when you're lifting, you're doing it wrong. And then there becomes this false equivalence of moderation equaling mediocrity. So first, uh, I guess, Eric, I'm going to open up to you, my man, kind of defining what really moderation is and then what it's not. Yeah, I actually love this topic because um, two things are happening here. One, we have a group of leaders in the community that are distinctly different from a large section of their followers. So, for example, we have a lot of people who want to get into better shape. They want to improve performance. They want to improve their life. But fitness is not their life. They're looking to use it as an adjunct to do something. But the people they look up to, fitness is their life. You and I, let's be honest. It's one of the hugest components of our life. It's something we love. It it informs a lot of our decisions, our businesses, our free time. Um, Personal trainers largely get into personal training because they want to figure out a way to make working out pay them. Yeah. You know, because that's what they do. They love it. They spend time on forums. They read books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the folks who created Westside, uh, the the bodybuilders who are, who are talking about nutrition for people outside of bodybuilding, um, the, the 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 fitness models who are always at eight percent body fat as a male or fifteen percent body fat as a female, et cetera, et cetera. These are all folks who. Will will be the ones who say something like, um, you know, moderation breeds me- mediocrity, or if you want extreme results, you have to take extreme measures, you know, um, or uh, obsession is the lazy man's word for dedication, you know, like those are all things we hear, and here's the frustrating part of that: those messages are almost impossible to carry out by people who don't live fitness. So just from a straight feasibility standpoint, you're asking someone to go right. I need you to no longer be a, be a, a, you know, a a mother or a businessman or a traveling salesman or a bus driver or a teacher as your primary thing you do. But instead I need you to be someone who lives fitness and then does that on the side. That's an unreasonable and sometimes unethical ask of people. Uh, It's just simply not logistically possible for those people who are following you for the other bodybuilders, all, all those other people. Great. But more funny and more ironic and more embarrassing for the people who say that, in my opinion, and I'm going to take a hot take here, Mm. is that it's actually easier to be extreme when you live life as fitness because you're an extreme person. Honestly, I can tell you from coaching hundreds of bodybuilders, it is way easier to follow a 5,000 calorie seafood diet mega bulk, which is extreme, pouring olive oil on your pizza, you know, taking weight gainers, force feeding until you almost throw up doing all of the volume, training super hard until you get hurt. Because it's a simple answer. You just eat everything and you train as hard as you can. Blood and guts, gore. And then you act like it's hardcore. But what you can't do, if I'm your coach and I ask you and I tell you it's better and you buy into it, eat just a 300 calorie surplus. Pay a lot of attention. Take notes and see what's the optimal training volume. Don't just do the big movements that might you know, cause you slight hip pain and actually have some some self awareness, and don't do 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 what's cool. Don't get motivated by the other meatheads around you and go for a max on a day you're not supposed to. Follow your program. Eat a reasonable surplus. You know, like give me a break. Like you're you're acting like it's something impressive when all you're doing is using a shotgun as a fly swatter. You know, balance is much more difficult than an than than, ext- than an extreme position. People make fun of balance, but let's be honest. The word balance literally physically means standing on a narrow object and trying to resist forces in either direction of doing too little or too much. And that is the constant Goldilocks zone you'd actually need to be in to get good results over the long term. Balance is difficult. You know what I'm saying? Like you tell someone balance is easy or won't get you good results. And you look at a gymnast who has the most impressive physique and balance on a bar. Of course, it's just an analogy. But my point is, is that balance requires constant attention. You have to make sure you're not going left, make sure you're not going right. Make sure you don't overcorrect when you're going right to go left. 
Balance is difficult, and moderation absolutely does not equal mediocrity. In fact, in my experience, moderation is what separates a intermediate or novice from an advanced athlete, because the advanced athlete has figured out how to sustain an, an impressive level of effort in moderation over the long haul for them. I would 100% double down on your hot take. I completely agree, and actually it's echoed. I couldn't help because I, I think of different analogies. In this case, I think of film, where often it has been said mastery is in the subtle details, the small details, choosing to, instead of show everything to imply, instead of trying to uh, tell the truth, provide the landscape so that the viewer can make the journey for themselves and then come to their own conclusion, where it's a lot harder, uh, instead of you know painting with a broad brushstroke, just these big, clear images where it, it, it's uh, too opaque, the message, where it's too easy. Instead, having some of that refinement, some of that balance, some of that resistance, I, as you said, it was incredibly easy for me, Eric. When I was on the seafood diet, I was not an individual that was used to eating a lot of food, but just to say, yeah, man, I'm going all the way in. And I had my football player buddies around me encouraging me once again to go over that approach. What's a lot harder is being meticulous, tracking or not tracking, but just being aware of how many calories roughly you're eating, how many would be optimal for your goal, as you said, a 300 calorie surplus for maybe a few years instead of this bulk cut, never really look great at any one point in time, always feeling kind of miserable where either you're dieting constantly or you just feel lethargic and bloated and you feel uncomfortable taking your shirt off. You know, you're just in this no man's land that you've created this your own personal hell. Uh, but yeah, you're hardcore, man. Your joints hurt all the time and you're not getting any stronger, but you know what? You sure showed them. When they said you couldn't do it, you tried and you still failed, but at least they can't tell you what to do. Um, I've echoed on the channel the concept before of consistent, intelligent effort, where uh, oftentimes, and you pointed that out when we had um, uh, Cliff Harvey and uh, uh, Danny Lennon s signal. He he is just the he Eric. He is the signal shining the light down to everyone. I I think. Yeah, and, and that's why it's such an excellent choice of a podcast name. Yeah. Signal Nutrition Radio. Yeah. Uh, shout out. Yeah, just a quick shout out. Uh, where you pointed out uh, correctly, just the concept for some people, the extremes, they have that natural tendency to want to be like that. But if instead you can apply an 8 out of 10 effort in the gym where I'm not saying you're not training hard, but you're organizing your training in such a way where it's submaximal. You're not you know, eating a thousand calories over, but you're making sure every day you're 300 calories over. Same idea when it comes to dietary compliance. Um, I've spoken with you and you've been such a tremendous help and now it's ended, I'd call phase one. Uh, it's the easiest mm. I've ever dieted down in my life. Uh, and I would, I'm not trying to say the hokey line because I'm not trying to sell anything right now, but it, it was like as if I was not dieting, but I was dieting. Um, the way they're set up after I read your overview when it comes uh, to physique athletes, which I self-identified, even though you tell you told me I was in the body and wellness category, I just ignored it. Um, and so the concept of you know being in a moderate deficit for three weeks and then one to two weeks of maintenance, dancing back and forth, which to some people uh, there's actually a bodybuilder at Fortis, and again, me being slightly social some of the time, not all the time. Um, this, this dude actually, I, I forget what position he placed in the amateur Olympia. I think he was at the Olympia in the amateur division. He's jacked out of his mind. Anyways, he just said, uh, you know, looking good, man. I said, thanks. And he asked me what I was doing. And I said, I'm dying. I'm dieting for three weeks. And then I take a two week break and then I do three more weeks. And he said, why are you taking the break? I said, you know, psychological reasons. I want to feel good. Also my performance is in that. And he couldn't wrap his head around Eric, the concept of me taking dietary breaks and he automatically equated uh, a, that longer approach with a worse outcome. Um, and so mm -hmm. some, sometimes we create those narratives in our head where if we apply more in a certain capacity, that we're doing better. As opposed to, you know, uh, last thing I'll say in A Bronx Tale, Robert De Niro has a great line that he says to his son, Kologico, uh, when he idolizes this gangster, um, Chaz Palmateri, and he said the real difficult work is basically what Robert De Niro does, going to, job, uh, to a job every day that he might not enjoy, but trying to provide for his family, being consistent with what he's doing day in and day out, not making a crazy amount of money, but just being so consistent with what he does that he's able to provide 
for his kids. It's like that actually takes more effort to be just consistent with what you do rather than be this flashy individual all the way in. So um, I, I think your hot take is not even a hot take. It's just real recognizing real, my friend. Well, thank you very much. And I think it's something that extends into all arenas, like the, uh, the the discussion we had around frequency. Last duo episode, the reason why it doesn't get considered is because people either want to do all the volume or all the intensity, which does make a high frequency inefficient, overtraining, and inappropriate. Um, and just like the, uh, the, the, the gentleman who was jacked out of his mind in the Amateur Olympia looked at you, you know, he, he thinks of probably time off as what he does right after a diet's over, which might be binge eating. Yeah. Uh, or just might have heard as soon as you said, hey, for psychological reasons, he might have heard weakness. Right. You know, that might have been what popped in his head, you know. When in reality, um, he's probably very good at stress management, but still experienced stress. And there's physiological reasons why taking time off the diet might even help. And uh, yeah, it's not a matter of willpower. It's not a matter of, of hardcoreness. It's a matter of it's easy. Yeah. It's easy for you to go all in. That's your personality. So just don't pretend that when you go all in, it's because you have this incredible work ethic. Just be aware that you're actually taking the path of least resistance, not the path of optimality. Yeah. You might have an extreme all or nothing black or white personality. Hey, guess what? So do I. And I can definitely follow a crash diet or a seafood diet. I've done that. Uh, but if you want to get to your true potential, maybe you need to not do just what's easy for you, which looks hard and which you can post about being hard, but actually which takes a little more moderation. Yeah. The, uh, the concept, the incessant motivational videos uh, that seem to reward those mechanisms of someone being, in quotations, hardcore – the five percenter i'm not like other people as if being like other people is a bad thing you know what i mean where you mm. have you're lumping all these accusations and all these uh broad classifications to a wide swath of individuals opposite. they're lazy it's like but wait a second what's this individual's actual goal it's like have you ever actually trained someone in your life this dude just wants to lose 20 pounds so that when his wife looks at him she's like yeah that's the man I marry. Like he, he has different reasons other than you. So if he should cheat on his diet, it's not weakness, right? If he should, you know, if he goes to the gym three times a week, it doesn't automatically mean that this guy is not this warrior or he's not going to even achieve his goal and how different goals have, let's say, different requirements. And sometimes I think people overestimate their requirements. They're so into a tribe. They're so into doing something. Like we love, like Eric, I could say you and Alberto straight up are two of the most dedicated individuals when it comes to training. Like I know when you guys train, you're there to train, you know, uh, and we all love lifting. So if we could do more of it, it'd be pretty sweet. Spend more time in our given hobby, but you can't really. And so it, it, ends up becoming this thing where you want to spend more time doing certain things. You come up for a reason. Oh, I want to be more hardcore. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Like I, I know someone that actually journals. It's nothing wrong with that. But in preparation for their lifts and will take time and plan things out and then write in a notepad in advance their workout. Just They kind of just want to inhabit the world for a little bit longer. You know what mm. I mean? This uh, chosen passion. As long as it doesn't have any deleterious effects, I would say, on your training, lifestyle, your family, your relationship with others, I think you're doing okay. 100%. I think that's well said. And that's a good rubric to figure out that distinction. Because um, you can you can live in bodybuilding in such a way that it does actually harm things. Yeah. Um, but you can also make things so automatic and so habit-based and something where, you know, you look up and you've been doing it for 20 years and now it's just like brushing your teeth where you don't have that same fire and that same passion. Yeah. So there's, I think, a fine balance to be walked in finding out what the appropriate level of keeping it fresh and new and making changes and getting emotionally invested and hyped up purely for the sake of keeping it fresh so that you stay motivated, but also not doing things like program hopping yeah. or following, a, a thinking being elitist or making suboptimal decisions and pretending they're optimal just because you actually, like you said, maybe you want to train more or harder or closer to failure. Uh, and then you just seek out whatever information confirms and makes that okay to do. Yeah, um, yeah it's just really being self-aware. Don't delude yourself. Be aware that if you're doing something for that reason, it's for that reason. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I train with a very high frequency um, because I like to bench a lot. I, I like to do these movements. But 
how do I then go, okay, how do I get what I want, but also get what I need? If I have these goals to be a, you know, the, the best bodybuilder I can be, um, that means, okay, I can train bench every day, but I only get three sets, mm -hmm. you know, or, or I can train quads four times a week, but I only get three sets. So that's, there, there are stop gaps there where I'm not just simply, okay, I'm going to be in the gym every day and for three hours, <laughs> you know, or I'm going to be in the gym every day and I'm going to do every set to failure. Like if, if, if I figure out what's, what's the closest I can get to that makes me excited and happy, but it doesn't sacrifice my goals. Like you said, preventing it from being a negative. While you're eating a Big Mac, I'm at the gym putting in the time and effort. Um, I, That'd be impressive. Like you have to set an alarm <laughs> on their phone <laughs> that notifies your phone. So like, hey, is he eating a Big Mac? Shit, I got to go to the gym. Because I'm yeah, that exactly. much better than you. Um, exactly. I think this was a fantastic conversation. This is the Mutual Admiration Society. But once again, we can never be wrong. So that just means it is the fact. It is the gospel. Um I probably want to announce at this time now that we're wrapping up, uh, Eric, uh, the seminars, um, the fact that we're doing a mass, uh, let's face it, masculinity, it's in crisis uh, right now. Um, mm. So our reclaiming your masculinity, do you want to give the pitch that we're, yeah, just hype it up a little bit, Eric? Yeah, so uh, any any city that starts with an A, uh, we're going to be coming to, uh, to so it's going to be the Alpha Tour, so we'll be in uh, wow. in Austin, um, we'll be in Albuquerque, uh, Arkansas, yeah. the, the whole state yeah. in general, yeah. unless it's a c city that doesn't start with an A, uh, Alabama. Um, we're going to be in Albuquerque, like you said. Uh, we're going to check out Arizona, Atlanta, uh, no specific city. Yeah. Atlanta, absolutely. Hot Atlanta, yeah. uh, we'll be there. Uh, and in general, anyone where it's a very inclusive seminar, anyone who can come who is male. Yeah. Uh, who identifies as male and who not only identifies as male, but identifies as the head of a pack. What pack? I don't know, but you're alpha. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and we'll come tell you how to keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And, we'll tell you uh, how to be alpha. Correct. Yeah. So you'll be alpha until you get to the <laughs> seminar and then we'll be alpha, but then we'll tell you how to be alpha, but you won't be alpha while we're there because we're alpha. So as soon as you leave, yeah. You will then be alpha. So it's, it's, it's a level up no matter how you look at it. The only time you're not alpha is when you're in the presence of the other alphas because really the pack is relative. Yeah. Um, so I think anyway. So for all, all my, my masculine boys yeah. uh, who, who want to be alpha, um, you can't be alpha in my presence, but I can teach <laughs> you how to be alpha in the presence of others. Yeah. So it's only going to cost a low cost of I, – I can't remember what we decided on for early bird. Was it ten grand? <laughs> so – I was of the opinion that was cheap, but you said, you know what, you want to do something for the people. Um, so it'll mm. be for the low price of $10,000. Um, you That's the early bird price. Early bird, yeah. If you sign up before uh, 2020, you'll get the early bird price, and then it, it doubles naturally. Yeah, just a standard kind of uptick. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, and honestly, uh, where do you put the value on your own value? Because if you are saying, oh, I can't afford $10,000, like, well, why don't you just go rob a bank yeah. or, or steal money from someone and embezzle from a charity? Whatever you need to do, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, because you're worth it. Yeah. You know? And if you don't think you're worth it, if you haven't robbed a bank or stolen from a charity to make uh, the, the money to afford our seminar, you've accepted being beta. And yeah. that's fine because then you should be in our seminar. Yeah, and we wouldn't want you anyways. And, you know, for those that say, oh, man, $10,000 is a lot of money, I hear a lot of individuals that still have both their kidneys, you know, because you have at mm -hmm. least, you could honestly probably buy then a seminar ticket for yourself, for your closest friend who's probably beta. Um, and mm -hmm. from, from there, it would just be... <sighs> I, I don't know. I guess the statement, I don't want to say anything too inflammatory, but if you come to the seminar, you are absolutely alpha, not in our presence. You're clearly uh, beta, but you're alpha for attending. And those that don't, we don't want to know you. Yeah. Now, honestly, I look at it this way. Life savings are for money that supports a life. And if you're not alpha, you're not alive. So if you haven't checked out your entire life savings to make our seminar. Yeah. And they aren't even really life savings anyway. So what's the loss? We look forward to seeing everyone. Um, now, there there will be, <laughs> I warn everyone, there'll be a ceremonial kind of, I don't want to say it's a fight, but when you enter, mm. we call it a dojo, the seminar. Um, there mm. might be an initiation ritual that will set some people off, but we'll 
we'll leave that for another time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything, Eric, you want to say in closing, discussing moderation, uh, vegetarian diets, anything you want to circle back to? Uh, you know, I think we covered it and anything else, they can just come to one of our <laughs> seminars in any town that starts with an A for ten to $20,000, depending on when they sign up. It's a steal. Uh, thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Iron Culture. We sincerely love reading the comments. So if you're on YouTube, if you like it, go ahead and give it a like. If you don't like it, because you know what? We are alpha and we don't care about your opinion. You can dislike it. You do whatever you want. But we do our best to mm. respond to some of them. If you're on iTunes and you enjoyed it, leaving a rating and review does help us out. We should, in all seriousness, have some cool announcements in the future. Stay tuned. We'll see everyone every single Monday on that next episode.